as uh, as Nicole alluded to, obviously the um, you know the main theme of this presentation or chat is to try and sort of dive a bit deeper into some um, just some things we might be able to do to try and cut the cloth a bit differently. I suppose through some times that we're sort of running through around high input costs and and da 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 da. So you know, obviously a big topic to cover, but so we'll fly over a fair bit of stuff pretty quickly. But you know, just you know my I suppose main objective for this with you guys is to just give you some key sound bites to hopefully go away and then look to um, dive a bit deeper into them, um, you know, and, and find out more that, you know, so you could apply them to your farm businesses. And what we're looking to do here is, is what I even call a bit of BAU. Like it's just that it's highlighted at the moment, just with these times we're going through. So, um, you know, it's no different to our business. We're doing exactly the same right now. We're looking at, you know, our, our cost of business and how we do business. And so it's, it's the same everywhere. So no one's, no one's alone in these times. Um, so yeah, just gonna have a quick look at title management um, of agronomy plans. Just, you know, is there some things that we could say push out or do a bit differently while still not, uh, you know, while still maximizing? Because I think it's important with the current high commodity co uh, prices at the moment, we still look to maximize. Um, yeah. And there's some things there we'll cover. Um, and then so just some three key thoughts from me around some, maybe some stuff you could do uh, to, to get a bit of low hanging fruit, um, for, you know, in this space. Um, so tighter management of the plans. So it's no secret in, in you know, always, but, you know, pre-season planning is even more critical this year, um, you know, with, with supply chain issues, but also um, the price volatility. So, you know, but I, I keep it really simple as much as I can. And when you're putting together these plans, you just need to make sure that we're matching these, you know, the feed that's right for the stock class, because, there's just real simple questions that, you know, you should be getting asked. And I've, I've listed those four questions there. And, you know, just what are you feeding? When do you want the feed? What do you want it to look like? And how much do you need? And and then, of course, then you just literally, you know, you are where you are and you live where you live. So, you know, that then limits the, you know, the number of forages you, you can grow. So what this allows you to do is then really make sure you are growing the right feed for the right stock class of, you know, for the outcome desired. Because what you find sometimes is, that there is some, you know, some crops we are growing that may be of too high quality and too high value for a stock class, or the other way around. So, it's important to understand this. Um, and and then articulating I think, that would be key to London. We're actually writing that down and oh, it and adapting yep. it. So we, so most people are doing. I don't know. I might be speaking out too many, but most people will be doing feed budgets, I suppose, or feed demands. And it's just mm. just taking that little bit more detail, like you say, Nicole, into that. It's just. Yep saying right oh they're going to get that rape crop with that baleage well it's it's you know it's not just they need you know 240,000 ton of dry matter it's okay well what is that dry matter makeup um, yes. for, for their requirement so yep. it's just diving a bit more into that detail um just make sure you're doing it you know for the right reasons um yeah applying gross margins to each crop gross margins are gross so again they are what they are but i think you know they just know what you're up for. Like, you know, we talk about input costs and prices of things have changed. And so I think, you know, it's, it's easy to do a gross margin on a crop with seed and chem inputs, but I think we definitely need to be diving deeper into that around cultivation costs, all that side of thing, um, need to start going into that crop and, and drilling costs and the likes, because they it, it's changed across the board. The, the price of fuel, you know, everything has gone up. So it's just making sure we know what we're up for and then again it's sort of tweaking you know if we can get away from a direct drill or a cultivation it's just again knowing um what you're up for because because certain crops require different levels of, of of cultivation and or drilling so it's just knowing what you're up for and then i'm a big fan of post-season review so yeah yes. we'll have all the we'll have all these plans in place and say this is what we're going to achieve and and that but it's just good to actually um understand where you did hit versus planned and, and you know what we did actually what we, they did actually achieve um, yeah. because we can't change the season and the climate so that's uh you know and you know it's just again it's just smart business it's just understanding where you're investing your money and where it's going to um mm -hmm. and, and there's a line there about growing or buying and feed uh, that's up for debate that's also i'm talking about rather than buying in your feed grain or buying in your maize silage you may be better to grow those crops in the current environments but it's again it's 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 area specific um yeah. and would you also with that gross margin applying um you know your actual yield potential for what you have previously been able to grow so setting that up and not 
applying too many inputs saying you know i want to grow a 20 ton crop but every year you've actually managed 15 so actually prioritizing and ensuring 100%, that you're 100 percent. and so what like long-term average so don't you know you might have got the 21 year if your long-term average is 18 you know apply it to 18 there's got to be a sensitivity in there um under not over because yeah. um you again you'll just end up with some little surprises so yeah, long-term average, um, set those gross margins up for it. And all you start to do is you're going to build a really good picture over the years of, of we, you know, what you're actually doing um, in that. Um, inputs worth by now versus what you acquire. I'm not going to really spend much time on that. It's it, The prices have gone up a lot. There's not a lot now that <clears throat> I'm trying to say is that hasn't gone up that well. Um, most stuff has mm. gone up. There's some stuff that's reached a ceiling, certain actives, but... There is some stuff's continuing to um to climb, but again, it just goes back to the preseason planning. I'd just put that back onto your retailer or your agronomist, or just as I'd be providing really good, robust forecasts of what you are needing in both seed and chemical, and then um and then it's up to them to secure that for you, you know, with the suppliers and, and in their business. Um, yeah, you know, we are hoping to see some softening sort of mid next year of some inputs, but. I hate to say it, the good old days are probably gone with some prices and things, but yeah. um, we hopefully may see some trending down mid next year. But it's as you all we all know, it's not going to come down in a hurry. Um, and then pretty simply, just prioritise your crops and your systems from top to bottom. What what you perceive is the most value to your business. And so I've just these are my suggestions: winter feed, supplementary feed, summer feed, depending where you are new pastures in the rotation and development and oversight. So it's then you literally then, which I'll talk about diving this bit deeper soon, you just then, that's where you invest, you know, heavily. And then as you get down that list, unfortunately, some things, crops will just have to, to miss out some. And, and this really just goes back to what we talked about before. Make sure you're growing the right crop for the right stock class. Double cropping can be a way of trimming some costs, but it's, it's, it is fraught with danger depending on your um, rotation and amount of times you've cropped. So you can think you're saving a cultivation cost or something in one hand, but you just got to really think about disease loading and, and that as well too. So again, just look at your system. Um, they can have more than one use. There's, you know, turnips and grass, rape and grass, um, you know, there's people putting plantain in with kale now to set up their, some spring growth. So, you know, you can look at multi-use uh, crops now. So that was always one of, you know, say a monoculture winter feed hole is say you graze it off and then you've got mm. this big, big ground. Mm. So, um, you know, definitely having, if you can have something in with it to just kick away um, or it goes back to that, that other point, you know, putting a crop, whether it's oats or Italian or something in afterwards, um, yeah, it's can a crop. Yeah, yeah, but that spring feed is highly valuable. Um, you know, post the winter feed crop, particularly in a breeding system. Um, mm. And so, but again, just remember what you might by adding something else in, you probably are giving up a little bit of yield of you know, say your dominant species, whether it be kale or whatever. So, um, and then just that goes back to Nicole's point she made before that. I just made that graph up. You know, just match your costs up with your potential yield and that's you know we sort of see it time and time again people setting it up whether it be fur chem whatever um for that 30 ton crop but yet their long-term average is 25 so mm. um that's all because everything you do to a crop should be yield positive if you can or what you're not going to lose something so it's just making sure that we are um you know we are you know spending these inputs in the in the right areas and getting something for them um, on the supplementary feed, it's, it's again, I, I don't mean this tongue in cheek, but we should still actually be looking to try and limit the amount of supplement when we need. I personally think, yep, barns, all that stuff will become a thing and grow in certain areas, but the cheapest form of feed is still standing feed. So, you know, if you can, as long as you're abiding by the regulations and the rules, and you know, we still should be trying to work at how we can make as much as we can in standing feed and then making up those buffers. With, I'm not saying don't have the summer buffer or the drought buffer or the winter buffer, do that, but yes. yep. don't sit there and sometimes if some people are very highly reliant on supplement and that's you know a, quite an expensive um, outlay now. But um, yeah, supplement feed paddocks, you can feed what you've already got. So, you know, younger paddocks, it might be, you know, just a question of buff, you know, buffering them up a bit and just feeding them a bit more. Another 
round of the ammos or the nitrogens just to, you know, versus putting a new paddock in. Um, again, multiple use paddocks, oats and grass, that sort of thing are, are quite um, attractive, particularly in a rotation because you get the good bulk of the oats and then the grass comes away afterwards. Um, short term, long term, um, it's again just comes down to your rotation. Um, you know, long term obviously generally is more of an upfront investment, but you know, longer term will be will be worthwhile, and you can also then use it for other stuff. Um, and then bulk versus quality, it's always a good discussion because yield is yield, and we all want to chase yield, and because that's king. But when you're looking at a crop, I'll just put up this graph here of some oats, and so. You know, when you look at the dark green, so that's what we'd call green chop oats, right? And so that's actually a really good protein product. So that's about 80 days from sowing. Um, that is a good protein product that can be used for young stock or on a crop like fodder beet, um, you know, to, to buffer up the protein that we're lacking. But, and so, but you can see there, we are only getting 55% of the total potential yield of that crop if we were to leave that crop for another, you know, 30, 40 days. But when you look at the light green bar, you're getting a different product. You're getting, you know, obviously a high carbohydrate mm. and a lower protein crop. So again, it's like, if you want protein, you know, that's where the green booting stage, yep, giving up some yield, but, you know, time and time again, we see it, people let them come out in air and, and they'll go, I want more yield, but then they leave that extra yield probably on the ground. So it's, Again, mm. it's just matching it up. And I know it's hard sometimes to look at a crop when you want more yield, but if it's actually the product you need and want, you've just got to take it. So, yeah. yeah. And I suppose you've got um, that opportunity cost too of letting that crop go through to a whole crop versus mm. actually getting something in um, once you've done your green yep. chop and you've got an opportunity there to maximise some further dry matter and set that 100%. up. 100%. So 30 days, you know, earlier, easily. To yeah. get um to get into something else, hundred percent, and then also the quality of that product too, if that's yes. you know what you're wanting. So no, that's that's definitely bang on. Um, summer feed paddock. So obviously, if you're summer dry or under irrigated, you've got to look at if you're looking to finish stock, you need mm. some crops. Um, and again, I'll talk about finish store later because it's more of a conversation then. But again, <coughs> well, it's well publicised crops like lucerne and that now. Um, can obviously add some real value here at multiple times a year um, versus, you know, again, more of an upfront cost. But, you know, I think, again, they can just add value year on year um, and supplement as well. Rape grass mix, again, it just goes back to that. Um, if you're wanting something to come after rather than just a straight rate crop, then you stitch your grass in, you know, are you able to add both in and, and do a you know, job and save yourself a pass and, um mm and save some time out. Um, new pasture paddocks, again, I'm not going to dive into this because it is what it is, but you just make sure the paddock's what you need and what you want. So, and then that's my second point, nice to have versus the needs. You know, it's good for seed sales and, and that, but the whole just throwing a kg of that and throwing a bit of that, just again, make sure in your mix that, you know, oh, I've got that in for that, I've got that in for that, that in for that, right? So it's just because it's real easy to just pick up a quick 10, 20 bucks a hectare just by not putting something in that's not actually adding any value and then it might yes. be making a, an agronomist job harder and they may have to take it out or use a different, more expensive chemistry. So, um, or you may be able to grab that 20 and put more clover in, which is probably more beneficial. So just, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm not meaning that in a diverse species regenerative conversation. That's more around just in our mixes we're doing. I think we can just make some wee tweaks there to, to save Keeping a buck it or, simple. Yes, so it could be save a buck, but it also could be spend that buck somewhere else to get more value, right? So, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Development oversowing. Um, it's just again for me, developing is developing, and it's just pretty simple. It's just a return on investment discussion, really. Um, you know, I think it goes back to the country that you're just going to get more most bang for your buck um, around yield and meat per hectare. Um, you could say you were looking to develop 100 hectares, you may look to develop 50 and, and so half your cost, but actually do it better. Like I think you could have your amount you're going to spend, but you actually grow, say, 60%, if that makes sense. So because you'll manage it better, you'll subdivide it properly, you'll do all this. Mm. So again, you can just pick up a wee small win there just by doing some less, but actually, you know, doing it, um, doing it better. Yeah. Um, and yeah, definitely keep an eye on uh, 
grass scrub areas this season. Grass scrub was very prevalent um, through the autumn. Um, so again, what you do there is just if it, you know, assess it on its merits and if it needs stitched up, um, it does, but it also may be better sometimes to just bring it into the rotation and just exit it um, sometimes also. Um, and the broadcast versus drill discussion, pretty simple. If you drill it in the ground, you'll see it in, you know, three months, four months. But if you broadcast on, yep, you'll save some drilling costs and whatever, but it'll take you six to eight months to see it. So it's just what you might save, what you might save in a drilling cost, you might not see it till, um, yeah. But we know why we do broadcast and drill and topography and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Um, pretty simple slide, that one. Um, so it's just, if you just focus on the input costs or a cost, you wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't buy a fridge. You wouldn't, we know why we buy a fridge. You know why we buy a TV. We get something for it. And so all I'm mm -hmm. saying there is just, what is the output from that input? So is it some yield? Am I not going to lose three ton? Am I, is this for all my next crop? I'm getting rid of those dandelions. So all I'm saying is we just need to put that light on spending that or either not losing that or making that right so yeah. it's pretty simple really but um you'd be surprised how much uh goes on with medic people knowing why um fertilizer input costs big input costs no secret um games comes back to priority um you know you might your budget might be the same as last year and unfortunately that probably will only go half as far um so you've again just got to prioritize those crops we talked about um and then you know i look at testing testing still cheap whether it leaf test soil test um still cheap and hey is it the year to, to dial up the lime and and um and focus on that the, you know the cost of goods there hasn't gone up much it's obviously the cartage and there's that graph there that's been around a long time um that's yeah. still relevant so that could be a nice way of just investing more in some lime and getting some of these more from these nutrients you've already applied or already have. Um, but hey, I'm not um, I'm not that well versed in the space. But that just as a as a thought. Um, See, so, um, grazing management utilization should be the main focuses when I look at seed and that because, yep, price of seed and rates and all that stuff. It's actually over a long term. It's it's not mm. worth really discussing yet. It's, it'll save you a bit of money at the start by whatever, but you know we can all get our calculators out and yeah, it's a pretty small number we have to grow to pay for that extra seed to give you some longevity and, and some persistence. Um, proprietary versus common, um, I think you know the shorter the term, the pasture or the product, you probably can more look at these sort of BNS type products because you're not needing to rely on an end of fight or you're not actually after longevity, um, and you're generally treating them pretty poorly. So. You know, you, you definitely you could maybe look at you know, saving some money there in the short term because the the gap's probably not as large. Whereas once we get into those longer term species, the the investment is definitely worth it. Um, yeah. You know, and and hey, and then but then there is also some VNS type legumes also too. So if you are buffing them all on hills and stuff like that, and she's, you know, your results going to be sort of the, your after is quite small. As you know, again. If you know you're not going to maybe get it that successful a role, maybe do look to try and find some cheaper type product to throw into those situations because yeah. Um, yeah. otherwise you could be throwing the money away. Um, legumes drive in, I'll talk about that soon. Um, and just again, if you there is moisture efficient species that can grow more with the same amount of moisture. So, you know, there is stuff like tall fescues and coxfits and certain ryegrasses that can, if, you know, for this every drop of moisture actually do more. Um, and then it goes that bottom point's just what I said uh, before around every species has to be there for a reason and add some value. Um, Akim, yep, stuff's gone up. Glyphosate in particular over doubled. Um, but yeah, just goes back to that tailored thing again, just make sure the wrecks are, you know, tailored for what the paddock and crop pressure is, not just blanket, you've got 100 hectares of kale and you walk in the gate, one paddock, and then just go, let's spray the lot. Hey, that's mm. cool, but, you know, maybe just... <laughs> look to walk a good sample or something like that because you might find depending on the paddock history or the soil type that that pressure could be lighter or whatever yeah um, and then second point talked about that just make sure that input is giving us some output a loss or a gain you know saving a loss or giving you a gain um and there is some species that are more tolerant to um 
the likes of grass grab and Argentine sim weave on stuff. So coxfoots and fescues and, and, you know, AR37 species. So, you know, that could limit, well, that might cost you a bit more up front. It might limit your need for, you know, insecticides or, you know, grass grub control. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm not going to really dive too much into minimum tool, direct drill, conventional. There's, everyone's got their little pets. But um, I, my only point to that is probably don't do one or the other to save. To think you're going to save money. Like, don't go, oh, I'll just direct drill to save 100 bucks. I think it's do it because it's yes. right for the situation. Like, because, yes. say, you might save a pass and direct drill, or you'll probably have to use some slug bait or you'll have to use in a grass specific herbicide. So, sometimes what happens is what you don't spend there you spend on some other area so you might use some more nitrogen to break the thatch down i don't know so just make sure we're doing it you know for the, for the right reasons again yeah um, that individual it, paddock assessment and crop assessment yeah yeah because like, yeah 100 percent. because yeah and i think we've got better at that like there's there's the whole, oh, no, this is all I do and how I do it. We're growing so many different crops now across different areas. So I think we definitely have got better at not being afraid to get different equipment in if we have to to, to make it right, which is um, which is good to see. Um, biological natural methods, I'm not going to, yeah, we haven't got, not that I, I would spend much time on this anyway, but it's. I think just all I'm trying to say there is, yep, there's a lot of stuff happening in this space around some things that are looking to limit, you know, insect pressures and da 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 da, da. But all I'd say is just do little samples or little little demos yourself um, and see how they go. Um, what will happen is, as you know, as I say, there's 20 offers right now. They might that'll shrink over the years, and so just do your little bit of DD and um, yeah. yeah, how that works on your farm. But I wouldn't be doing large scale, um, you know, farm. Wouldn't all of a sudden do a big U-turn and go straight there because. The data is still still trying to learn that these things actually add value and say what they say they're going to do. Um, yes. yeah. um, so that's really the input, guys. And then just three key thoughts, which for me to finish on really is just, you know, you look at a, a margin time a year and a place you can actually make some money. And, you know, this just goes back to me getting asked a lot more. And, and when I was out there doing it, probably around what's my, you know, oh, what's the best finishing feed and what, am, what can I do to make my lambs do 300 grams a day and, yeah. and all that. And, you know, lactation is a key time in any business and whether that's second round in a dairy farm or, um, you know, a sheep farm with lambs at foot and, and cows and calves. So, you know, I think we need to be really more focused on what we're feeding an animal at lactation and, and you know, make sure we're, we're nailing that because I can tell you now, if you nail lactation, um, you know, most other things that take care of themselves, you'll you might you know, you'll be weaning 30k to see i'm not saying you have to finish lambs off mum it's just you'll be actually you know you'll have a more forward store product to market yes. rather than a 26 kg lamb so yeah. it's you know your highest margin so i think you know i did some quick mass because there is some foragers that are better at this time of year say september than others and even rye grasses like heading mm. baits so you know even there is data going around there's certain grasses like mid heading grasses that might do even only 400 kgs of dry matter um, say in one period, um, you know, that's the equivalent of another 22 years for a week, you know, so it's, it might not sound like a lot, and I wouldn't be able to see what 400 kgs looks like, but yes, you know, yeah. another 22 years on a sheep and beef farm, it's gold, or feeding 22 years better, so yes. it's, um, there is, you know, we, we've gone to late heading grasses for reasons, but there is some good mid-heading stuff out there that can add a bit of value, and then, you know, most people, we're not here to talk about tall fescue today, but, you know, tall fescue still is a bit of a beast in that space, um, you know, that can add some value, so again, it's just making, the whole key of that is to just maybe look at your lactation and your balance, and when I'm looking at heading dates on a farm, I'd still so if you are ryegrass dominant on, you know, even if you can look at 25, 30% of your, you'd say your grass area being in something mid heading or early heading would, would be advantageous. Um, yes, yeah. Um, legumes, well publicized. They, you know, the free nitrogen, um, they're not passengers anymore as far as, you know, oh yeah, give me that grass and then just throw a bit of clover in. It's, you know, I think again, we've got to, change our mindset around um you know how do i you know foster and have more legumes in my pastures around do i bring my sowing rate bad my grass a bit and up my legumes yeah it might give out a bit of longevity but um you know what those legumes are adding both from a 
a nitrogen point of view, um, but also a live weight gain point of view um, is, is huge. And, um, you know, we all know we've got to get the most benefit. We've got to, um, you know, have the million grazing systems um, because the whole big bang for our buck is that urinary nitrogen, which we're obviously trying to limit in dairy farms, but in, in greatest, you know, more, most farms, we're actually trying to, uh, you know, get more of it. Yes, um, and utilise it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, and it's also, again, it goes back to, uh, to you know, those assessing those crops in year four and five for legume content and not being afraid to, if the grass has got another four years, like top those legumes up because all you're going to find is you'll just be giving up production both in, um, you know, meat and yield of, of forage. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to talk too much of them because you know they're well publicised, and I, but I think it's just more of mindset change. Um, mm. How can I integrate and maximise more legumes on my farm? And as, as we all know, there's multiple options that we can choose depending where you are or, or what you're trying to achieve. Um, yeah, and I presume the, the old ton of legume, 25 units of nitrogen, it's pretty easy mass at the moment. Um, and then final points, just yeah, crop rotations. Been a fan of this, always have been. So. You know, it just sets up a farm so much better for the short and long term. Um, you know, I think it just adds so much to your system, not just on that crop. So, you know, for me, it just allows us to be a lot more strategic and, and make sure, again, we're, 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 we're subbing in the right crops for the right time. And, you know, and, but also don't feel like we have to give too much up with break crops now. There used to be an adage back in the day, oh, I just put that in for a break crop, you know, and you're giving up yield and money there's so many options now around break crops that can actually add feed and money at a real key time and so whether it's a cash crop or a rycle crop or whatever mm. so just um you know i think again all i'm trying to say there is just look past multiple seasons and, and again that can be understand plans change but it just allows things to be a lot more strategic like around herbicide management and, and knowing where you can and can't um, and then also disease management as well too of crops um, and yeah bottom point there just don't skimp like I know sometimes we always want to get it back into the high value the long term thing but if sometimes if the weed burden's there and the fertility's not right or the paddock's not right just don't be afraid to take a year because yeah. um, that seed cost is the same if you grow 100 tonne in a lifetime of that forage or 80 tonnes so it's mm. um, it's just you know making sure again we're, doing, we're setting it up right um, yeah, and so apart from that, that's um, that's me on that front. Cool. Thanks, Linda. And I suppose probably the key messages out of that is actually articulating those plans, getting some um, specific advice from an agronomist and really working through, you know, that yearly plan going forward, but also looking at that um, over time as well to set those key inputs up to get the best out of them. Um, and I, I suppose the other key point too was looking at where you make the money, that lactation period, and how can you maximise that um, as a key point. So that's awesome. Thanks for that. Thank you.